Hi, welcome to another Always Reforming Podcast. This is Bobby Grow. This is going to be a quick follow-up podcast, and I mean really quick. Um, follow-up to my last podcast, responding to Leighton Flowers and Jordan Cooper and the podcast uh, Flowers did on that and the concepts that he uh, worked through as far as uh, primarily uh, human agencies capacity to say yes or no to God. So what he calls the human in- inability or total inability concept vis-a-vis uh, total depravity. And so he's against that idea. He's against the idea that we're born as human beings um, totally incapable of choosing to seek after God, choosing to say yes to God's um, salvation. Leighton affirms the idea that we are born um, incapacitated, but not fully dead uh, to God, so that uh, even post fall, as we are born into that, he he believes that we are still capable of saying yes or no to God when the gospel is offered to us. If you go to his website, uh, soteriology one hundred one dot com, and just go to, I believe it's his about page, or actually I think he has a page just that says beliefs. Go to his beliefs page and it'll bring up a statement of faith that he affirms. It's supposedly representative of a majority of the Southern Baptists. Of course, the Southern Baptists that I know um, on Twitter in particular, they're all PhDs. They, they're they all Calvinists. So maybe it's just the... And, and I know there's a tussle internally within the Southern Baptist Convention itself still, as there has been for years between the Calvinists who supposedly are the minority and non-Calvinists who are the majority. And I think that's an old dynamic. I think the new dynamic is that Calvinism under Albert Muller and his leadership and influence in the Southern Baptist Convention, that Calvinism has taken a more of a... Uh, turn towards being the more uh, affirmative position among those who are identifying as Southern Baptists. Of course, Leighton is attempting to uh, undercut that through his work on his podcast on Soteriology 101. But, so that's, that's an interesting dynamic in and of itself and one that Leighton doesn't really talk about that much. He just focuses on the non-Calvinist approach or what they call traditionalism originally, and what he is now retitling as provisionism. It's his kind of version of the Southern Baptist traditionalism. But, yeah, when you go to his beliefs page, you'll see that he's talking about, or he's fir- he affirms, this idea of uh, <laughs> an idea that sounds almost exactly like Pelagianism. It's pretty unbelievable, to be honest, because he's constantly saying that, that we need to deal with what the Bible says. And of course, I agree with that. I mean, I'm, I'm committed to the Bible. I, I can read it in Greek, the New Testament, and the Septuagint. I can, I've read through the Bible. I'm on my 42nd time through the Bible. I mean, I'm committed to the Bible. My master's thesis was an exegetical analysis of 1 Corinthians 1, 70 through 25. I'm committed to scripture and its authority. I'm a, I'm a Protestant. I affirm sola scriptura. And, but I, like I said in my last podcast, um, the way Leighton approaches biblical interpretation, the way that he, he constantly uh, is saying, give me uh, chapter and verse to make your argument for your position 
is not representative of the way that the majority of the Christian tradition has exegeted scripture. And that's what I was really saying in, in my last podcast uh, as far as um, challenging Leighton's approach to biblical exegesis and the way that he just appeals to scripture that way. And that's why I said that's not a fruitful approach because really that's representative of what happened in the 18th century. In, in Gabler, he kind of was... He, he kind of turned the tide by a paper he delivered. I believe it was, it was in the late 1700s. I forget the exact date. I think it might have been 1780-something. But he delivered a paper, and in that paper, it, it, it signaled, essentially, a turn towards a naturalistic approach to interpreting Scripture versus the... the previous uh, conf- confessional approach uh, to interpreting scripture. And the confessional approach to interpreting scripture coincides with Sol Scriptura's emphasis on recognizing the role that interpretive tradition itself, the, the significance of tradition that we all actually have, even, even post-confessional interpretation of scripture is, is in and of itself a tradition that people use to interpret scripture through. And so, essentially, the way that Leighton refers to scripture reflects this turn to the non-confessional, naturalistic approach to scripture. It's what I would identify as uh, a Lockean, like John, after John Locke, a Lockean approach to engaging with scripture as if we are tabula rasa, that we're like these clean white slates, and that when we're uh, come up against some external stimuli, we have this kind of uh, ability to engage with new stimuli without any sort of presupp- presuppositional or pre-understanding background. And and I know that Leighton would say, no, I don't, I I don't think that. But that's the way that that you, Leighton, do engage with Scripture, that when you're talking about chapter and verse, this proof-texting way of engaging with Scripture, that's not the confessional way of of engaging with Scripture. Sure, you can look back at the confessions and and catechisms and creeds in in the church of the church, particularly of those of the Protestant ilk, and they're gonna, they're gonna have a whole bunch of verses attached to their each of their confessions and their chapters and their confessions. They do have a bunch of verses attached, but there's an exegetical um, framework that those are rooted in. And it's also, there's also a, uh, just a deeper understanding of the role that um, tradition plays in the interpretive process that you don't seem to appreciate. So I'm kind of going off again. Uh, But basically, what I really wanted to say is that Leighton's approach to salvation, even though he says this isn't true, it is, it is true. You just have to go read what your documents say, Leighton, and what your statement of faith says, what you affirm and what you deny. And I just wrote another blog post last night that quotes that and compares what you guys affirm, that you say you affirm, um, next to what Pelagius believed about free will and our retention of free will, a capacity of free will towards God, that we can say yes or no to God, that the gospel doesn't have to, and when I say gospel, I mean uh, that that's all-encompassing of God's grace, and I see the gospel actually, personally, that Jesus himself is the gospel. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. I don't think in these abstract terms, like these qualitative, substantive terms that you, Leighton, do. So that's kind of ironic as well, because you are constantly critiquing uh, the Calvinists 
and yet you still operate from the same conceptual pool, the same substance metaphysic physical pool that the Calvinists, and so, same with the classical Armenians, they all operate from these same concepts. So that's also ironic, because you think of grace in terms of a substance, a quality. It's an abstraction. It has no theological groundedness, rootedness in God's very life. And so that's a serious problem. And that's what I wanted to say. You have a lot more in common with those that you critique conceptually. And so it makes your critique, in my view, not very strong whatsoever of their positions, especially when it comes to this issue of uh, theological anthropology, because that's what this issue is. We're talking about human nature, and you don't frame it that way very often either. But that's what this is. This is a discussion about anthropology and what are the component parts that make up a human being quorum deo before God. And you aren't transparent, at least, about that, about what's going on there. You just constantly say chapter and verse. And I keep harping on that because it's a problematic, or it's, a, it's superficial, I should say. It's like a superficial thing to say. Of course, that's what every Christian would say. And yet there's something deeper going on, even for you. And you're bringing concepts to Scripture that themselves are uh, theologically or philosophically uh, developed ideas. And it illustrates my point my last for my last podcast, that you are not coming to Scripture naked, like John Locke would have us think we we can, that we're like tabula rasa. That's why I said that. We're not that. That's not true. We all have presuppositions, pre-understandings. Immanuel Kant, if, if nothing else, that is a, a valid point that he uh, identified about reality, that we all have these lenses that we approach reality through. And that's true for us Christians as well. And that when we become a Christian, we are placed into an ecclesial situation, a, a continuum of beliefs that have developed over the centuries. And depending on what denomination we are situated in as we become Christians or grow up in or what have you, that's going to be, those are going to be the lenses that we view Scripture through and reality through as Christians. And so I'm, I'm, what I'm asking you, Leighton, is to become more self-critical of that reality and to recognize the role that that plays in the way that you interpret Scripture. And so what, I'm in, I, what I am identifying with your approach is that you think of grace, think of uh, anthropology, the component parts of human nature, you think in terms of what has been called Thomas intellectualism. We have in the history of ideas uh, what's called tripartite faculty psychology. I mean, and it's just a common uh, understanding of uh, medieval, particularly, and prior to medieval, but a classical understanding of how, how theologians thought of the human makeup. And it consists of the affections, the heart, the intellect and the will. And your position, as you articulate it, fits very uh, well with what I keep calling Thomas intellectualism and Norman Fearing in his book, which I don't recall the title right now, um, develops what that is. And so does my, my mentor, Ron Frost, in his book, in his published uh, PhD dissertation called A Spreading Goodness. And... Essentially, Thomas intellectualism is the idea that the intellect remained intact after the fall, therefore providing a, uh, a capacity, a latent capacity retained within humanity even after the fall that allows them to cooperate with God in their salvation. And so we see this 
in Thomas Aquinas's uh, synthesis of Aristotelian categories with Christian theology. That's what his project was about, by and large. And then this kind of thinking trickles down into the Protestant frame of reference through the Reformed Orthodox. And interestingly, uh, Leighton, you pick up on these antecedents in your own thinking. And so this, these are the kinds of things you want to uh, relegate to just tradition or history and as, as if they're not, not primarily significant, as if they're unsignific unsignificant or unremarkable insofar as that relates to interpreting Scripture. And that seems to be what you think is your bread and butter for your entree into this whole uh, discussion. But I'm saying, Leighton, that these things are mutually implicating realities and that you cannot simply just brush it off like that. That's dis that is disingenuous. And it leads to some bad uh, biblical and theological reasoning. And it can result in you affirming things that you say you're not. Like Pelagianism. Your anthropology, the way that you guys have framed your statement of faith in regard to salvation and, and its appropriation is anthropologically Pelagian. And if anybody's interested and you're listening to this podcast, you can go to my blog, go to the Leighton Flowers category, hit it, and you'll find uh, my most recent post, which is the first post you'll come across right now, um, with, and this title is Leighton Flowers a Pelagian. And I share his statement of faith, and the pertinent parts um, of that. And like I said, I compare that to Pelagius and his thinking. And it's <laughs> it's pretty shocking when you compare what Leighton says he thinks about free will when as compared to what Pelagius thinks about free will in salvation. And grace. There's almost no difference. And Leighton says, well, sure, yeah, there's similarities, but even if there's similarities, it doesn't mean that I'm a Pelagian. Well, that would only be true, Leighton, if those similarities are equivocal, non-material. But the problem for you that you cannot, that you have not overcome at all, You've only evaded this. You keep evading it. So it's not that's not a good way to argue. Like you're constantly trying to correct uh, uh, James White on this as far as his style of debating and the fallacies he constantly commits, which, yeah, I don't. I'm not a fan of his whatsoever. But uh, you are similarly not arguing well. Because you just evade, evade, evade. And then you look at what you guys actually are proposing. And it's the very thing you, you're denying. Which is, I, it, I don't, it, it doesn't seem serious. That It's hard to take you serious anymore. As I've looked at what you write, which is a better way to get into this, I think, rather than just listening to podcasts, I think. The written word is, is a lot more concrete. And so as I've looked at your written word at your website, it's clear that you affirm Pelagianism, plain and simple. You can give me links to David Allen and Harwood and others, but all that they're doing is through ver verbosity is evading. I mean, there's only finite possibilities uh, conceptually, and they haven't made a work around these Pelagian implications. And why is this Pelagian thing so significant anyway? I mean, that seems to be the question that you have, Leighton, and that's why you call it the boogeyman. And a lot of your followers who came after me on my last podcast, so I closed the comments because I'm, I'm not in it for that, to be trolled by people who don't know what they're talking about. But... I just don't understand, like, why uh, 
you don't grasp why this label is so significant. Why? And let me explain why it's so significant, since you don't ever seem to touch upon this, Leighton, with, uh, for your audience. The reason Pelagianism and that label is significant is because it says that a Pelagius is saying that we contributed something to salvation, that we made God's salvation uh, contingent upon what we did, by what we choose, what we think, what we've reasoned to be the good, the beautiful, the way, the truth, and the life, rather than allowing God to unilaterally confront us with the good news of the gospel, to confront our, as Luther would say, homo in se incurvitas, the incurvature of ourselves upon ourselves, where we're enslaved, his bondage of the will, that's the Augustinian turn. Love of self, concupiscence, being trapped by a lo- self-love rather than love of God. That's John 3. That's Bible, Leighton. That's sound exegesis. We love the darkness rather than the light. It doesn't say we progressively come to that point. It says, as a matter of fact, it's an indicative We love the darkness, Leighton, from Scripture, rather than the light. There's some proof texting for you. So, this is why Pelagianism, you don't want to be a Pelagian. We don't want to leave any room, any space, where we can say that we we even cooperate with God in our salvation. And you're not even saying that, Leighton, which is pushes you into the full-blown Pelagian position. Like Thomas Aquinas' understanding of grace as qualities, and he has this, these ideas of created grace, operative and cooperative grace. Those kinds of concepts are semi-Pelagian because it says that we can, we can be infused with grace through the sacraments uh, dispensed to us by the church and by, by which then we can habituate in those and cooperate with God and ultimately merit salvation as we um, gain access to, the, to these merits that Christ has won for us over and beyond uh, uh, just uh, his death, but his acts of obedience, that there's this treasury of merits that we have access to as we cooperate with God through this infusion of grace. That's, that would be a semi-Pelagian understanding of salvation and how it's appropriated. But Leighton, what you are saying correlates to what Pelagius maintained as far as the free will. And it would be something like this, to, to stay in line with the analogy of how things work in the Catholic Church. It would be something like this. So we walk up for communion, the Eucharist, in Mass, in the Mass, and the repre- representation of, of the atonement of Christ in the Mass, as that's being re- uh, replayed, so to speak. And so that we walk up to the priest, he hands, uh, or he, he puts out his hand with the, with a piece of bread to put in our mouths, and, and you're saying that the person can just simply look at that piece of bread and, and think, you know what, that doesn't look good. I'm not going to do that now. I don't, I don't want that. No, thank you. Or you're saying the person can say, I do want that today. And then they can take, they can ingest that piece of bread and experience God's grace and, and uh, appropriate salvation that way. But you're, do you see how that, looks by way of analogy that the person it's it's the person there's something inherent to the person that they have the capacity to say yes or no in themselves Leighton there's no grace given so it'd be like a first time communion taker to use my language to use our Protestant language it'd be a first time communion taker they've never been infused with grace they can look at the grace symbolized by the bread and to 
decide from somewhere in themselves, inherent, internal to themselves, I do or I don't want that. That's Pelagian. That's not even semi-Pelagian, Leighton. That's the analogy of your system of salvation, your way of thinking about uh, human free will and the way that it operates um, within each person. You can say, well, God made us that way. Well, that's what Pelagius said, too. So this is why these things are so problematic for you, Leighton. And you have not overcome them whatsoever. So you can evade. You can have people... Um, and I'm not going to... Actually, I won't, I won't go that way. I'll just say you can evade personally. There's your followers, are, of course, some of them, the ones I encountered last night in my comment thread, are nasty, don't know what they're talking about. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to mute them, block them, and stop them from saying a word to me because they can't even demonstrate that they know what they're even talking about. So I'm not going to entertain any of that. I do know what I'm talking about in this area. I've spent years studying this, just like you, Leighton, and maybe longer than you. I don't know. That doesn't matter. What matters is I do, I do know about these things, and I'm challenging you. I don't even agree with Cooper, Jordan Cooper, and his, his, he's Lutheran. I'm not. I'm Reformed, an evangelical Calvinist. But he's right to label you a Pelagian. I do agree with him on that. And you're gonna, of course, you're gonna you're gonna find a lot of people who who are going to agree with that out there who don't know any better. But um, I'm challenging you on this. And yeah, I have ten subscribers on my YouTube channel. I mean, I just started it two days ago, but. And you have, what, 27,000? So, but ideas don't care about numbers. Ideas and truth and reality can just be one person standing up and saying, no, that's not true. And that's what I'm doing, Leighton, with you, is that I'm challenging you. So... <sighs> I think you should you should uh really think about these things more theologically and just quit evading by trying to hide behind the Bible. I mean, I can I can go toe to toe with you, Leighton, from scripture. Absolutely. There's lots of people who can. And that's ultimately not the decisive factor, and that's the point. It's not the point. I mean, you can make exegetical arguments, but that doesn't – the exegetical arguments themselves, knowing the Greek grammar, the Hebrew grammar, you have to make interpretive decisions even when you're translating, like the Greek. Like you have to decide – like Galatians 2.20, for example, are we going to go with a subjective or objective genitive when we're, when we're translating uh, pistis Christu? The faith of Christ. Or we can go with the subjective or objective genitive. And how we decide that is has a lot to do with our prior theological commitments and our whole engagement with the text of Scripture and its reality and its implications. And so that's just one example, but that carries through and all the way down. So once again, Leighton, your theological commitments and convictions shape in a spiraling fashion the way that you engage with Scripture. That's why I keep, I keep harping on that because it's so significant and you seem to not appreciate that point. It's very important. That's why if you go debate James White again, if he ever took you up on that, I mean, what kind of would be the point of that based on the way that you want to do that? You want to do the exegesis of Romans 9 and show. And I don't disagree that. Uh
at a level, the his- historical grammatical level, that yeah, there it we can do exegesis in a self self referential way, per the literary factors and grammatical realities inherent to the text and the historical component parts that make up the text. Yeah, we can do that exegetical analysis, but it has to be placed within and informed by a broader theological framework, as all of that ultimately is, especially when we're trying to decide questions like you're dealing with all the time, Leighton. Like you're dealing with theological topics. These are questions that may or may not be um, organic to the text of Scripture. They might be artificial. And I think a lot of the whole discussion that you're having is very artificial. Just like you think Calvinists and the categories that they, you, you would say, impose upon the text of Scripture are artificial. I think most of the categories you're using, Leighton, are just as artificial. Because I don't think that they rise out of the text naturally. I think that you have already, you have adopted a framework, a bunch of categories, a bunch of symbols for thinking about the gospel. And then you go to scripture and you find anecdotal anecdotal examples that help to illustrate because you're big on using analogies. And it seems like that's the way that you interpret scripture by and large, by way of analogy and illustration of a prior set of convictions, beliefs, theological points that you have adopted prior to scripture. Making your approach just as artificial as a Calvinist's approach, in my estimation. And to make that worse, you affirm a Pelagian anthropology, even though you say you don't. And I haven't heard Ken Wilson and how he evades that either, materially, at all. It's not enough just to say, yeah, that he's read all of Augustine in order, the way that Augustine said to. So what? Who cares? <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't uh, mean much. I mean, it's cool that he has that kind of devotion and commitment to to reading Augustine like that. But as far as conceptual matter, how has that undercut what Pelagius taught and beyond what Pelagius taught, how does that undercut um, the destructive nature of that conceptually as far as uh, the idea that we have free will? I mean, that's really the nub of this whole thing. If we have free will... Abstract from God. Abstract from God. That's this is that's the whole issue right there. That you're claiming that we have free will by nature. Abstract by uh, abstracted from God's life. As if, like I said in my last podcast, there's some other category of freedom that's distinct from God's freedom. A, a category that's inherent to human nature, even if it has been designed that way by God. That it's inherent to human nature. Ironically, uh, Leighton, if you think about it long enough, uh, what what you're saying actually fits into the the theory of causation that you the, of determinism that you say you re- reject you reject and you harp on constantly. But your idea of free will and human nature actually fits into the idea of primary causation because you say that God designed it that way for human nature to have to retain this free will and then this retention of free will in the human nature as a component part of human nature actually correlates to second the secondary causation that uh, Calvinist determinism operates from so uh, that's what i'm saying like these concepts that you're using they're just the same concepts the same metaphysic as those used by the calvinists the ones you are attempting to refute over and over again. And then what's worse about your conclusion is that you affirm this abstract free will. And then you say that we just respond when the gospel is offered from ourselves, though, and that's the problem, Leighton. And I don't, that's the, the part that seems lost on you. So, anyway, 
this has been another off the off the top podcast. So I'm sitting here killing time. But I just wanted to say a little bit more and this time be a little bit more forceful in the way that I say it because this whole thing's absurd. I mean, I'm I'm done probably dealing with you Leighton, but I just think that you need to think much more self-critically. You need to delve much deeper into the realm of historical theology, the history of ideas, and appreciate a lot more the way that that shapes the way that you interpret Scripture and that you can't simply hide behind Scripture the way that you do because that's what you're doing. And as a result, you're affirming a position that's uh, historically understood as heretical with a big H. And yeah, you can, you're, you're an, I, I think you are a nice person, that you clearly love the Lord, that your intentions are good, but your theology is terrible. What you're promoting is wrong. And you need to rethink things and to be open to this kind of criticism as well. So you want James White to take your criticism? How, how about you take other people's criticism and not simply ignore people who you think um, – sound hard and harsh and things like that. Why don't you just listen to like what I'm saying, for example, and go look, go do the work yourself too and see if what I'm saying is true about the, the history of ideas. And I know you say you have, but all, all that you do to prove that is you give me links to these guys who, who are doing the same thing that you're doing just with even more verbosity and under the guise of like academic uh, research papers, which I'm not even sure if they're peer reviewed or anything. So anyway, I better end this, but I'm just challenging you Leighton to really think about these things. And I'm concerned that you are leading people down a path that's it's going to bite them in the end so all right everybody thanks for listening this is this is i've, I've gotten a little riled up in this one but I'm, it is frustrating to to deal with this to look at this and then have somebody seemingly just evade 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 and hide behind scripture and you can def we can all do that i'm not saying Leighton's the only one doing that. I mean, I can do it. We all do it to at a level, but we need to be open to hearing that, I think. So, all right, till next time. Adios.